Hello and welcome to this month's Downtown Aviation and Redevelopment Subcommittee. My name is Daniel Valenzuela, Council Member for District 5, and I'm honored to chair this subcommittee. I'm here with my colleagues, Councilwoman <coughs> Delta Williams, excuse me, District 1, Councilwoman Kate Gallego, District 8, and on the phone, I believe, uh, not quite yet, we will have Councilman Bill Gates from District 3, and I understand he will be joining us by phone on his way into the meeting. So uh, on, on this particular subcommittee, we began each subcommittee and we end it with the call to the public. It's just, it's more than symbolic, but it is also a reminder that the public gets the first and the last word. Uh, that being said, I don't think we have any cards for item one, which is the call to the public. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, that would be technically item two after uh, call to order. Uh, item three, approval of the January 7th minutes. Move approval. I have a motion and a second. Could we correct uh, Louisa Stark started the paragraph on her comments on the FAA as a woman and ended as a man, so could we correct her gender? Thank you for catching that, Councilman. Move is amended. Excellent, Move. second. Uh, nice catch. Uh, we have a motion and a second as amended. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Item four is for consent. Uh, and we could, I can entertain a motion unless we Move want. Approval. Okay, we have a motion. Second. And a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Great, thank you. Item uh, number five and six are information and discussion. Item five is the FAA changes in aircraft departure procedures update. This is a standing uh, a standing item on this subcommittee, given the uh, the issues with the FAA, uh, and this is just another opportunity for the public to come out and and uh, you know be heard, but give our our talented staff an opportunity to to give us the latest updates, latest and greatest. So, thank you for being here, Tammy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, subcommittee members. I'm Tammy Fisher, acting aviation director, and with me today is Mr. Chad Makovsky. Assistant Aviation Director and Ms. Judy Ross, uh, Deputy Director of Planning for the Aviation Department. I wanted to start our update just to give you an update of as of uh, January 20th, we have now received over 3,000 complaints from 720 households um, who have been impacted by the uh, flight path changes made by the FAA in September. We continue to log uh, those concerns and transmit that information to the FAA. And we also are providing information, we'll talk more in a moment, uh, in a variety of new ways based on community feedback, um, but certainly skyharbor.com, we have worked to improve that website based on uh, community feedback. Um, we are still returning calls, just returned one myself this morning, uh, and uh, we'll continue to provide our monthly noise report, which we have always done, but it does provide some uh, good facts for the community um, related to this issue. As I'm sure you were already aware, uh, the city manager received a response from the FAA administrator, uh, Honorable Michael Huerta, on January 22nd in response to uh, the city's request that the FAA return the flight path procedures back to their original or back to their procedures prior to September 18th, uh, the FAA administrator indicated that they would not uh, do that, but they did recommend a uh, perform what they call a performance-based navigation working group, uh, assembling that group to work on mitigation strategies and changes that uh, might be feasible to implement. Um, we have, um, as requested by the City Council on December 16th of last year, we have, um, and that should say January 26, 2015, uh, we have uh, submitted all of our um, records uh, or made them available to the City Manager's Office and the City Council uh, related to this topic. We are still waiting. We have requested um, all documents related to the um, what we call the RNAV or Area Navigation Procedures uh, from the FAA and uh, we have been interacting with them but we have not received those records. It was a very broad all-inclusive request and so I uh, anticipate it will take them some time to gather those records and transmit them to us. I don't have a specific date 
uh, when I expect to receive those documents. But uh, again, we are in contact with them and, and getting uh, information as we go. And then also uh, we committed to uh, and got direction from the mayor and council to conduct noise monitoring um, and that is underway uh, as we speak. Just to recap some of the meetings we have uh, had, uh, aviation staff did participate in a, a Glendale City Council workshop and were available to respond on noise um, information and noise uh, concerns that had come through the City of Phoenix Aviation Department uh, in January. We also uh, had our first of three community outreach meetings. Uh, the first one was held at Cesar Chavez High School and we had uh, 86 attendees at that meeting. Um, as I mentioned, um, or maybe I didn't mention already, on January 21st, um, I was um, uh, fortunate enough to accompany the mayor and uh, Congressman Ruben Gallego uh, at a meeting with uh, Michael Huerta uh, the day before the letter came out um, where we did uh, convey very directly and, and personally to the administrator our concerns about um, our important um, downtown area and uh, communities that surround the airport and, and expressed our concern about the dramatic impact um, that these new procedures have had on our our community as a whole, uh, but also in, you know, individual residents and, and their personal uh, lives. Um, we had the FAA regional administrator here the following day in Phoenix who uh, made himself available and uh, had individual briefings with uh, council members as well as aviation staff. Um, and then we had our second uh, community outreach meeting at Metro Tech High School. Uh, with 102 attendees and then finally our third on the 24th which was a Saturday morning uh, third meeting at Phoenix Art Museum which had 105 attendees so we're very pleased um, with the turnout at these community meetings and again the point of the community meetings was to understand how we can better communicate um, with residents and community members as well as um, get their feedback on the noise monitoring process and where uh, those locations should be and also um, you know their input on what needed to be done to solve the problem so with that I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Makovsky who will go over some of the feedback from the community meetings and changes that we have made as a result of that feedback thank you Tammy uh, Mr. Chair members of the subcommittee this snapshot here really just represents a, uh, a summary or a highlight of the key points that were raised at uh, the outreach meetings that were uh, took place throughout the the valley uh, the three outreach meetings that we had, had done that week um, I apologize for the clarity of this for those who may not be able to see it I do want to note though that this is available at skyharbor.com uh, for download it is a PDF format so uh, folks will be able to get a look at this and it's also important to note that this is not all inclusive so we received a tremendous amount of feedback from the community at those three meetings this was really uh, an opportunity for us just to kind of summarize at a high level kind of the sentiment of the communities in the meetings, but uh, we are compiling more detailed analyses to include all of the comments we received. And again, we will, uh, our Landerman Brown consultant will uh, analyze that and we'll also share that with the FAA. In the upper left, uh, really it's kind of a, a graph to show what the community really expressed the most concern about. If I were to summarize the top three concerns, uh, the first would be the quality of life and health issues related to aircraft overflights over their neighborhoods. Uh, the second would be uh, concern for the decrease in the home values related to aircraft noise in neighborhoods. And the third would be that the, uh, the public viewed uh, the change that took place to be an economic or a wealth transfer, uh, essentially where the communities are paying a price uh, which ultimately benefits uh, the airlines who are flying over their neighborhoods. And so those are really the three concerns that, that rose to the top of the discussions. Um, on the right-hand side of the, the graph, it, we asked them, what are some, some ways that we can address this issue? And you can see in bold, overwhelmingly, uh, the vast majority of the community said, first and foremost, we need to go back to the prior routes. They worked, uh, and that's what we want to see. We did ask them though, if for whatever reason that is not possible, what are some other things that we can do or we can recommend to the FAA to consider uh, as, they, as they go back? And you'll see there are a number of other things uh, uh, that were recommended, including uh, modifying the flight paths, increasing the altitudes, uh, dispersing flights over different neighborhoods, those types of things were all brought forward in, in those sessions. 
And on the lower left, uh, we asked, how can we keep the community up to date on, on progress and developments as we move forward uh, with the FA on this issue? And they came up with some tremendous uh, uh, ideas. And, and we've actually, I'm very proud to say on, on this next slide that we have already implemented a good number of those recommendations. Uh, we are more frequently, thanks to our public relations division, more frequently keeping the community up to date on Facebook and then Twitter uh, for those who are connected in that forum, the social media forums. Uh, we also are providing uh, council members and their staff with uh, information and updates as we get them so uh, they can be made available in council newsletters and other ways to communicate to the community. We also are working to uh, put information on how to get information in the water bill uh, that goes out so the entire community has access to the latest information through, through that. Um, and one of the things we really heard from the community was skyharbor.com is uh, a, a website that has a lot of information and it, it appeared as though the updates were kind of getting lost in the bigger website. And so what we did is we created a dedicated page at skyharbor.com where all of this information is available and uh, we created a convenient link to that page and it's uh, right here on this slide. It's skyharbor.com slash flight paths. And so if anybody goes there, it will direct them to the page where they'll have all the latest information on, and updates. And then finally, uh, a lot of the community is connecting with each other in Phoenix on nextdoor.com. And we know that uh, the city has been really taken advantage of that to provide information to communities. And so we have uh, worked with the city manager's office, public works, and public safety to uh, engage those communities through the Nextdoor forum. So those are all ways that we are uh, communicating. Another uh, thing we heard is that our website for noise information isn't as robust as many airports' uh, websites related to this type of community outreach is. And so one of the things that we're looking at is the website itself, the noise information uh, page. We want to provide more resources for the community. Uh, and so we've asked our consultant to look at best practices in the industry. What are the things that are of value to the community? What are the things that we can put on this page? Uh, do we have appropriate tools uh, for the community to use? And, and below is actually a snapshot of what some airports have done in, in, across the nation. They've actually created a public portal where the community uh, in a self-help way can go onto this portal and see flight activity in near real time. Um, I believe there's a few minute delay, uh, but they'll actually be able to click on a flight and you know maybe they heard a flight go over their house that was abnormal. They can actually click on that flight. They can plot their address and they can find out exactly the horizontal distance, the altitude, the slant range, they can find out all this information about these particular flights. Uh, they have detailed information to show the uh, aircraft operator, the type of airplane, all of that would be available at their fingertips. And uh, what they can do is, is by clicking a button on that, they can click uh, to register a complaint or a concern about that flight directly with us, as opposed to um, generically saying at about 1230 I heard this flight, what was it? Uh, so that'll give us more accurate information to work with as well. So uh, this is uh, just an example of something uh, that I think this is a representation of Dallas-Fort Worth. I'm not sure if they're using this particular portal, uh, but this was an example that was brought to our attention and we're really interested in moving forward with something like this for our community. And I'll turn it back over to Tammy for next steps. Thank you, Chad. So our uh, next steps, as I mentioned, uh, this week we have deployed uh, noise monitoring equipment based on community feedback um, in the community. We will conduct that monitoring, gather that data, assemble that data, and then um, schedule additional community meetings in March to present the results of that noise monitoring um, to the community. Um, we are, as I mentioned earlier in the letter from um, the FAA administrator, um, he suggested forming or convening a uh, technical working group, performance-based navigation working group. Uh, we are working with the FAA uh, to understand more about how that will work and what that is and how we uh, need to participate in that and we'll continue to work on that. Um, also, our legislative strategy, uh, we will be uh, continuing to engage with uh, members of Congress and our uh, Washington representative, as well as agency partners, uh, the FAA and our airline business partners, uh, to stay engaged on this issue as it gets resolved. And then also, I, I, I think we will need to come back to uh, the city council at some point. Right now, we have been given policy direction to um, 
request that the FAA revert back to the prior flight paths, and we will continue to uh, convey to them that we're not happy with no as an answer. But I think as this technical working group starts to form, uh, we'll need to have some direction on how we can work with uh, the community, the FAA, and other technical representatives on other alternatives. So if we can't go back to uh, what we had in place, then what do we want to ask for next or as an alternative to that? And so um, I think at some uh, future council meeting or um, this subcommittee, we may uh, need to request some direction there. That concludes our presentation, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments by my colleagues? Okay. I, uh, Councilman Gates, oh, we, we just finished the FAA uh, update. Any, uh, I, know, I know we have all the information just to the point where, do you have any questions or comments? Thank you very much. Apologize for being uh, late. Uh, good they had no here. idea. They thought you were on the phone, so you just told on yourself. Oh, there we go. <laughs> hey, you know, <laughs> honesty is always the best policy, right? <laughs> Honest Abe here. <laughs> oh, so um, I will just, uh, I will mention, uh, you know, again, to our our city staff, our, I don't like using that word staff, our team, to our team, thank you so much for doing your diligence. I know you've already conducted so many meetings. And the FAA has conducted meetings, and you've, you've done all you, could, you can, and you're doing all you can to keep everyone up to speed on when the meetings are. Uh, we're doing things like this, giving everyone as many opportunities to be heard as possible. And I've said it several times, and sometimes uh, my colleagues, some of all my colleagues, uh, uh, we, we do like poking fun, and, and we, we are, we do get along. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've said this a million times, public input is not a box that simply gets checked. It should never be treated like a box that just simply gets checked. We should be governing based on this information, based on public input. And I think, I think though the, uh, and I am gonna include myself in this, uh, some, uh, or, you know, organizations or entities that say the FAA, uh, may appear that they, in this case, don't operate that way. The city of Phoenix absolutely operates that way. Uh, and and you, were, you were showing that. Now, as far as the meeting that took place that you mentioned uh, with Mayor Stanton, Congressman Gallego, um, this is a good thing. Uh, it, it, it's a good meeting to have. Now, I think, I also agree. I'd like to see these paths revert back to where they were in the first place, okay? Um, that that said, the conversation, it's healthy to get the, you know, it's a good thing for the FAA to agree to bring this same working group together to look at this. You know, even if they say it's unlikely that it's gonna revert back, we need to start that conversation. And we would not be this far into the process if the city of Phoenix operated, you know, with this understanding that public input is a box that simply gets checked. You know, this is proof that, that we are really moving based on, on uh, everyone's information, everyone's questions and comments. So, so that being said, again, thank you for, uh, for just doing your diligence, keeping us up to speed, and, uh, and all of us have done some work here, as you know. I mean, we've, we've written every member of the federal delegation. I know some of us are going back uh, to D.C. Uh, next month. In fact, where I'm sure we, we are going to be, you know, having more meetings with the FAA, uh, getting in front of, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Huerta and, and others, uh, you know, that that's going to be ongoing. This this is something that's big for, you know, it's important for all of us. So uh, that said, again, thank you for the time and and putting in the effort. If we have no other questions or comments, we will we will move on. Thank you so much. Um, okay, number six, item six, Aviation Department Five-Year Capital Improvement Program. Mr. Chair, uh, 
Chad Makovsky is going to present that item with our Deputy Aviation Director, Judy Ross, and I will remain at the table because at this point it would be awkward for me to leave, <laughs> but they will do the presentation on our Capital Improvement Program. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee, today we'd like to share some highlights and key projects for our proposed uh, fiscal year 2016 to 2020 Capital Improvement Program. That program covers three of the city-owned airports, uh, Phoenix Sky Harbor International, Phoenix Deer Valley Airport, and Phoenix Goodyear Airport. So as you know, maintaining a system of modern, uh, safe, secure, and efficient airports uh, is really critically important to the region uh, that we serve. Uh, our most e recent economic impact study was completed by ASU's W.P. Carey School of Business, uh, School of Economics in uh, 2011, and it concluded that the Phoenix Aviation System contributed $28.7 billion uh, to the economy and, and into the region. Um, the airport system employs over 55,000 employees, uh, and if you look at secondary economic impact, over 240,000 jobs are supported with a payroll of uh, nearly $9.9 .9 billion. Uh, the 2011 study also e analyzed economic impact related to construction activity and construction projects on the airport. And it found that for every construction dollar expended, $2 are contributed back to the regional uh, economy in terms of secondary impact. All of the uh, projects in the program today are funded through multiple uh, funding sources, which include airport operating revenues, uh, capital grants, passenger facility charges, and revenue bonds. In other words, uh, all projects are funded only through user fees generated at the airports themselves. Uh, no general fund revenue or tax dollars are used to fund airport capital projects. In the current five-year program, uh, we value it at $652.2 million. The vast majority of the program is funded, uh, really, the vast majority of the pro uh, program funding, excuse me, uh, will be focused on our Terminal 3 modernization program, which, of course, uh, you've heard much about over the last several months. However, we preserve program funding to ensure critical infrastructure projects continue to be executed at all three airports. Uh, it's important to note that uh, we are very uh, careful to analyze our program budget, and we only move forward projects that uh, have a really the greatest demonstrated need. Uh, we do this to ensure that we're able to maintain among the best bond ratings in the industry, so we have access to lo the lowest market rates available. Uh, we also want to ensure our costs uh, remain low so we remain competitive uh, market for air service and for the airlines uh, so they want to continue to do business right here at Sky Harbor and in the Valley. And we do just that. With a cost per plane passenger of under $6, uh, we are among the most cost effective airports uh, of our size in the nation. And in fact, most airports our size have double that cost per plane passenger. So we're very proud of that. The capital uh, funds uh, include annual co uh, contributions to the Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport. Uh, we are a member of the airport authority. The annual contribution is $1.3 million for a five-year total of uh, $6.5 million. And as the front door to our community, we're eager to embrace the values of the community we serve. And one thing that's very important to us, and I know uh, Councilman Gates, very important to you and all of the, the council members, is that uh, we focus on sustainable measures uh, moving forward. The department's been working very closely with Chief Sustainability Officer Mark Hartman and is committed to contributing uh, to the citywide sustainability goals. In fact, Sky Harbor completed the West Apron LED uh, lighting project just in time for the NFL Super Bowl team and friends and family charters. And so they got to see these beautiful new lights. It was the best lit ramp, I think, in the nation. It was very nice. Um, moving forward, the Terminal 3 modernization project will be designed to meet LED our LEED Silver certif uh, certification standards. Uh, we also believe uh, that we'll be replacing existing light fixtures on roadways near Terminal 4 uh, with LED lighting, which we believe will allow us to achieve a reduction in energy consumption by nearly 57%. So we're very excited to move that project forward. Uh, design for that project is planned in FY 2016. We also plan to convert additional airfield lighting, including taxiway connectors, runway guard lights, and other ancillary lights on the airfield to LED over the course of this five-year program. In short, we're committed to incorporating sustainability measures into each and every one of our projects uh, and our airport system. Oops, excuse me. And finally, we recognize that the airport system is here to foster um, economic activity and serve the needs of our community. Uh, relating to our previous presentation, uh, for the last 14 years, the airport has maintained a community noise reduction program in the valley uh, in the areas surrounding uh, Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport. With that program, we provided sound insulation, mitigation services, as well as voluntary acquisition and relocation services for residents who uh, would prefer uh, that option. 
Uh, we did that uh, in communities that fell within noise impacted areas as defined by government standards, the 65 DNL contours that we have near the airport. And we're entering in the final stages of this program, it's, and it's scheduled to sunset in FY 2016. So at this time, I'd like to turn the pr presentation over to Deputy Aviation Director Judy Ross, who will discuss some of the key projects, as well as some of the budget numbers for the upcoming program. Judy? Thank you, Mr. McCoskey. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk about some of the project highlights within the capital improvement program in the aviation department. Um, I'll talk about projects in each of the three airports, and I'll start off with Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport. The first project is the Terminal 3 Modernization Project, which I'm sure you all are well aware of. And this is uh, improvements to an aging infrastructure and will, uh, will um, improve the overall customer experience um, as they transition through the airport. And part of the elements within that modernization project is a consolidated checkpoint, improved ticket counters, new baggage carousels, new vertical circulation, and new and expanded concessions. This project, as Mr. McCoskey indicated, will be LEED Energy certified and it will be constructed over a period of years. The second project is our communication center and EOC. The existing facility is at capacity and where it's at now, it's not feasible to expand. This is a critical project for us in that the communication center is integral in coordinating our daily responses to our customers. In addition, it's used for all emergency and non-emergency responses where airport management and other emergency response teams respond to when an airport incident warrants that type of activation. We'll also use this facility to coordinate the high activity and high profile events such as what we've had last week, the Pro Bowl, the Super Bowl, and also presidential visits. The next project is the Terminal 4 Terrazzo. And as you're well aware, Terminal 4 is our busiest terminal at Sky Harbor Airport. The carpet is frequently replaced due to heavy customer use. Terrazzo flooring is durable and it's also very cost effective. Flooring solution, it will not only enhance the, the appearance of the terminal, but it would also improve the customer service. This project proposes to install terrazzo flooring and replace the carpeting in the heaviest traveled areas within Terminal 4. And then the Terminal 4 North Apron is the reconstruction of the north side apron to improve the aircraft parking at the aircraft gates. This is an asset preservation project and will improve the safety conditions in these parking positions. Now we move on to our two general aviation airports. The first one is Deer, the Phoenix Deer Valley Airport. And as you're aware, this Phoenix Deer Valley Airport is the busiest general aviation airport in the country. The key project at Deer Valley is the reconstruction of north side aircraft parking aprons and the tax links between the hangars. This project is necessary to preserve the payment structure for the aircraft users as they transition from the runway and taxiway system into these hangars. The last project I'd like to talk about is the Phoenix Goodyear Airport. And as you were, Phoenix Goodyear has one runway. And this is a rehabilitation of that single runway at Goodyear Airport. And this will improve the runway surface condition and extend the life of its pavement structure. Now this graph identifies 10 years of experience of CIP um, at, in the aviation department five years prior and five years going forward. And as you can see, the latter five years from fiscal year 2010 to the current year is really influenced heavily by the SkyTrain activity and the SkyTrain construction. And the current year, which is 2015 to 2016, is really influenced by the commitments coming in for the Terminal 3 modernization program. The later years are generally normal type projects we do on a normal basis as we spend down those commitments for the Terminal modernization and the Terminal modernization project goes forward. I'd like to talk a little bit about the proposed funding. Um, the aviation department does go through a financial feasibility analysis, analysis at least annually on the CIP to make sure we can still meet our financial policies. And as you can see, the predominant um, funding sources within the CIP are revenue bonds due to, to Terminal 3 modernization, our aviation revenues, grants, and passenger facility charges. Now, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have regarding the aviation CIP. Uh, any, any questions, comments? I, I have just a, a quick question on, um, Tammy, you just talked about, or maybe it was Chad, the, the new software. Mm -hmm. 
uh, the real time flights. Mm -hmm. Is that included in this budget? And if so, where? Uh, Councilwoman Williams, that's a, a fantastic question. The amount uh, that we'll spend on this new software will actually be something we'll take out of operating funds, so it won't be included in the capital budget. But we have uh, capacity in our operating uh, budget to be able to, to handle that addition. And, and I wanted to ask before and then didn't. How soon do you think you would have that operational? Uh, uh, Chairman Valenzuela, Councilwoman Williams, the, the, the vendor we're working with said that once we uh, advised them to move forward, they would believe they could have it up and running within weeks, probably within two to three weeks of, of our saying go. They, they, it's very easy for them. In fact, this vendor that uh, we are talking uh, to uh, is one of uh, several that provide this solution. However, this particular vendor, the one that I showed on the, on the screen, is uh, the same vendor that we use for the flight data that we receive. So it might make sense for us to use the same vendor for the data we receive as the, the information that's going out to the community. Um, they are ready to go. We just need to give them the go ahead. And we wanted to vet that through this subcommittee before we did that. Very good, because I think it's a great idea. Okay, thank you. Councilwoman. Congratulations on a successful Super Bowl. That was very exciting and good that a lot of advanced planning that went into making that successful departures in particular, uh, with some challenges from Mother Nature. <laughs> yeah. um, one of the feedback I did get, though, is that people felt there was room for improvement in our parking in terms of being able to navigate in terminal parking and that um, people would love more visual cues that there's a different parking lot. On, um, west and East was confusing to people and that they appreciate when some of our other parking lots have color coding on floors so that we give people as much information as possible to help them visually guide themselves back to where they began and more signage is always appreciated. So uh, when we also, I think, have at this committee had discussions about additional services we could offer in airport parking, could you give us a little more resolution on the parking line item? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Council McGaigo, what I, I do know is that, uh, for example, in the Terminal 3 modernization program, we recognize Terminal 3 in that parking garage is probably the most challenging facility in the entire airport for our customers to navigate. And so we have paid special attention as a part of the Terminal 3 modern, modernization program to incorporate um, design upgrades uh, to help customers navigate. We believe uh, there is no one single solution for that garage other than to perhaps tear it down and build a new one. <laughs> uh, we don't believe that that's realistic though. So we are looking at a variety of, of signage improvements. Uh, we just completed an LED project in Terminal 3 garage, which is uh, lighted the facility much brighter than it ever was before. That has helped people to uh, identify where their vehicles are. Uh, we also believe there's a technology solution available that will allow people to navigate uh, and identify where they park their car so when they come back, they can uh, identify where it is. So those are some of the, uh, the near-term projects. Um, in addition, we are looking at level count systems so our customers, when they go into the garage, they know which level has the available parking. Uh, we currently have that at Terminal 4 and in one of our East Economy facilities but we are looking to expand that out into other facilities as well to help our customers. Wonderful. Well, if we could put Terminal 4 Garage, if, if there's opportunity on the financial side, I think our customers also have interest in, in that garage system as Thank well. Thank you, Councilman Weaver. And then I also uh, agree with Councilman Gates that sustainability is important at all of our facilities. And in our discussion about Terminal 3 modernization, we did talk about individual metering as much as possible, particularly on the electric side, but if possible, water side to help our private sector vendors have more control and more data about their energy use with the idea that if you give people the financial incentives to be green, it's a win for our customers at the airport and the environment. Councilman, that absolutely will be incorporated into the Terminal 3 modernization pro project. We are uh, doing the retrofits at Terminal 4 uh, as we speak. Terminal 3 will be including that in, in the modernization program. Wonderful. I think that's a priority for us on the council side. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the presentation. It's nice to have the opportunity to kind of get the long-term view of, of what's coming up uh, at the airport. A couple of these things I just would like us maybe to drill down on, maybe have a, another presentation in the future. Goodyear Airport. Uh, I'll blame myself for this, but I've been on the council for five years. I don't know what we do out there. So I, I need to understand, and I'm guessing probably a lot of my uh, constituents do as well, a significant you know we're talking ten million dollars what what how does it tie into what we do 
uh, at the City of Phoenix. Why is it an important part? Um, and then I think a presentation here. Uh, and then also Phoenix Mesa Gateway. You know, I, I hope and anticipate that we're going to have a significant discussion about six and a half million dollars. Uh, the airport's been in the news lately uh, with some of the actions we've taken here in Mesa as well. Whether or not that's a smart investment, quite frankly, moving forward, or whether we could be, you know, I, I'm not questioning the investment that's been put into it uh, up to this point. I support that, but whether this is the best spend of, of our revenues or, or whether, you know, we ought to be directing that investment in another way, I'm sure that discussion is going to take place. I want everyone to know who's looking at this, it doesn't mean that we are going to spend this money uh, or that this council has agreed that we should spend uh, that money moving forward. So, you know, Mr. Chair, potentially those are a couple of areas that we could look into um, in the future on this subcommittee. Uh, Mr. Chair, Good. Councilman Gates, you're absolutely right. Um, this is a budgetary plan. Mm -hmm. um, our uh, authority to spend um, as a partner at Phoenix Mesa Gateway is um, approved by the City Council through fiscal year 2016. So any uh, spending beyond that would need additional uh, council authority. Um, but we do plan for that in our capital improvement budget. We do characterize this as a capital expense and so there, there's where it lives in our uh, capital program budget. And then finally, um, uh, appreciate what you had to say about LED uh, lights uh, at the airport. That's something that came up on the subcommittee that I chair and uh, would like to see us, you know, as aggressive as possible. Obviously, the council indicated their support for uh, doing an RFP on street lights around the city, but uh, the airport, for a variety of reasons, uh, I support your efforts to move as quickly as possible to get those savings uh, to improve our carbon footprint at the airport and also to send that message you know to, to those people visiting here that, that we are we are focused on sustainability we're focused on saving money uh, and so thank you for your efforts on that and uh, councilman Gates thank you for your efforts on that as well and I know we have other champions you hear councilman Gallego and councilman uh, Williams I mean I, I we all agree that we we need to be a more sustainable city and we're moving in that direction and, and I think we send that message when you're flying over now and you you look down and you see the the solar panels for an example so I I totally agree uh, Sky Harbor is one of the ten busiest airports in the nation and I'm preaching to the choir uh, but just for the benefit of those that are that are watching uh, there is a $79 million daily economic impact on a typical day. Uh, more than 1,200 aircraft arrive and depart. Uh, more than 100,000 passengers arrive and depart. More than 800 tons of air cargo is, is handled. And these are, you know, I mean, this is a big deal. And this is our economic engine, mm -hmm. not only for the city or for the valley, for the state. And, and we have to... Uh, look ahead at things like the CIP, a capital improvement project program, to to take care of our economic uh, engine. So, uh, and you know, and to keep it modern and to move in the direction of sustainability. And uh, and and you know, I'm really proud of our of our airport. I know I'm not alone. You 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 know what you've been able to do with the now again mention. The, uh, the the food and, and beverage package, for example, in Terminal Four, and and the exciting things that is expected on the retail side, and the expansion, and all of the you know SkyTrain. People are going to be going to the airport with no intention to getting on a plane, <laughs> you know, with the SkyTrain, go to lunch, do a little shopping, and that's really exciting stuff. And and uh, we can't get there unless we are thinking ahead, and and um, you know, and we have a plan like this, so. I commend you, uh, and I agree with with the comments by uh, by my colleagues. And uh, that said, I am supportive. This is just for uh, this discussion, correct? Do you need action on this? No, I don't. This is for uh, and and to the point of, of uh, Councilman Gates, and we'll. Maybe we'll discuss this at the end, but maybe a future agenda item is to get an informational item on 
the other airports that Phoenix is uh, is doing business at. And I think it's it's for everyone's benefit, just as what was mentioned. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, brings us to uh, item seven, RFP for West Fillmore Development. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee, staff is here today to discuss um, our continuing efforts to advance the downtown strategic plan, uh, which has been uh, focused on a number of items, but one of the principal focuses is how we have more people living downtown. Um, ultimately, a sustainable community in the downtown is fundamentally dependent upon the amount of disposable income that's available to be spent to support all of the businesses, uh, as well as having a, an employment uh, pool from which businesses can draw for employees. And so we have been working diligently across the last number of years, and staff is here today to talk to you about what we believe to be an exciting opportunity to add as many uh, as 1,000 new residents uh, and hopefully um, essentially recreate a neighborhood in the west part of downtown. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Scott Sumners, uh, our Deputy Director from the Community and Economic Development Department. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Mr. Chairman, subcommittee members, we're here today to talk about uh, a property that we call West Fillmore. We were before you last month to talk about this property and a different uh, uh, item. Uh, last month, we asked for uh, approval to enter into an agreement and acquire the property. I'm happy to report that as of Friday at 315, the city now owns seven and a half acres of city property in this area. So we are ready to move forward, and we're here today to talk about the request for proposals that would go out to uh, private sector developers. So with me here today to cover that is Dan Clocky from the Downtown Phoenix Community Development Corporation and Juan Salgado from the Phoenix Industrial Development Authority. So uh, just very quickly, the um, site that we are talking about is in the uh, west, northwest part of downtown. It is 7.4 acres on either side of Fifth Avenue. Um, and as Paul mentioned, this is a, a significant size development with incredible potential. Um, a project of this size really has not uh, been done since uh, Arizona Center. Uh, we've got an opportunity to turn what is almost exclusively uh, vacant properties into activated uh, properties with, uh, with homes for up to 1,000 new downtown residents, uh, generate uh, about $100 million plus in capital investment and uh, really make the west side of downtown uh, uh, very much improved and, and uh, there's a lot of upside here. So um, there is, uh, in, within the property, there's a complex kind of ownership condition. Uh, we own a portion of it. The Industrial Development Authority that Mr. Salgado represents owns a portion of it and it's a little complicated here, um, but we are ready to move forward. We are 100% on the same page and our mission and our goals for this RFP are in alignment. So that's, that's a very positive thing. Um, from a background standpoint, uh, we've been, as Paul mentioned, at this for a long time. We've been acquiring property for the last five or six years. And looking forward, uh, there's quite a ways to go on this, but today is a great milestone that we're ready to put this out to the private sector and ask for input and direction and proposals for private sector development. So, as part of this, we did a planning study commissioned through the Downtown Phoenix CDC, and I'm going to turn it over to Dan Clocky to cover that portion. Thanks, Scott. Uh, members of the Council, uh, just wanted to touch briefly on this process so that there was a, a clear understanding of all the different steps that we took to make sure that this was an inclusive process that really looked at the community, looked at the property owners, obviously, as well as uh, making sure that the economics fit with what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, so you see here in front of you a uh, project schedule. I won't go into the details on this. Basically, the last six months, we've been working with the property owners, with um, some uh, community leaders, uh, and obviously with our, our higher professional help that we were able to secure through a LISC grant, uh, the Local Initiative Support Corporation. Um, Air St. Gross did the planning and architectural work on this, and Jim Belfiore Real Estate looked at the actual economics of, of what would work here. So some of the key uh, things that we talked about were uh, density. Just for your information, this is actually the, the, the highest uh, zoned parcel of land in the state of Arizona. I could build 600 feet here if I wanted to. Um, but we know that that's probably not what's going to happen. And so we want to really look at what could happen. What would, make, what would make sense to the neighborhood? What would make sense from an economic standpoint? So the density level was a very important discussion in this. 
um, how do you break this larger uh, piece of property into different parcels depending on the needs and so forth of the development community and of the community. Um, one of the key uh, elements of this is a paseo. I, I won't bore you with all the details, but basically this is going to allow us to have a lot more of an east-west pedestrian friendly and vehicular access to the site. Those are large super blocks. They used to be orchards 100 years ago, so they weren't laid out as city blocks. Um, now that we hope to, to do that in order to facilitate a much more uh, pedestrian friendly environment. Uh, the other item then was the school. Uh, I know we've talked to you about that in the past. Uh, there is an interest in having an urban school here, and you'll see in a later uh, slide uh, a site that potentially could be that, that school. And then obviously having a, a good scale and community character. This is the site for those of you who uh, would like to see the specifics. This is along Fillmore Street on the south side between 4th Avenue and 6th Avenue. It also includes uh, the Ambassador West, uh, which is uh, an affordable housing project owned by the City of Phoenix. I uh, won't bore you with all these, but uh, there was a lot of work done again and again. And what this, what this really is about is Air St. Gross coming back with different ideas and the members of this working committee, uh, both property owners as well as community members saying, well, how about this and how about that? And, and they would go back and forth and we did this quite a few times and settled on in the end three or four different concepts with a real focus on this one that I wanted to point out. A um, couple real key things in this. Uh, the larger parcels that you see are the parcels that we expect there to be more of a, of a residential um, uh, sort of focus, either condominiums or rental. Um, we've studied the market for both and uh, have talked to the development community about it. Both have interest in, in, in those types of products. The Paseo that I just mentioned then would be at the east-west thoroughfare cutting through here. And then the other smaller parcels that you see, the 0.72 and 0.5, could be potentially a school site. Uh, before that would happen, though, we would want to replace any affordable housing that was, uh, that was removed from that site and could be rebuilt adjacent to the existing affordable housing that you see there on the 0.9 acre and 0.3 acre site. So this is just a quick summary of that concept uh, and the possibility of all the different uh, um, housing units that could go there, as well as some retail along Fillmore Street. Um, and then the school, you'll see the school, potential school site is in yellow. The dark purple, if you can see that, is the affordable. The dark blue are condominiums. And then the light blue is rental with a parking garage. And you'll see a little tinge of red up there that is some retail along Fillmore to try to keep that feel going along Fillmore Street where the VIG is and Chivo is as well and having some of the success. So uh, the recommendations then by this, uh, uh, by the committee, by the professionals, was that this in fact was more of a residential site. That is not to say that we exclude any other uh, 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 developers coming forward for other proposals, but from a market standpoint, this is what the experts were saying probably made the most sense. Um, and so as I said, it would be a range of condominiums and rental potentially, um, or all of one. Uh, we're not going to handcuff the development community on this. We want to be able to have them be able to respond to it as the market um, uh, comes along. Activating Fillmore Street with some commercial space. Again, this would not be a huge amount of commercial space. It would probably be some smaller sites, maybe for coffee houses or something along those lines. That would be more of a pedestrian friendly uh, type retail. And then really focusing on the connectivity and the shade. So we're kind of creating the, the outside of the envelope, if you will, and setting up the parameters. And the development community then can fill in that big chunk of land with what makes sense from a market perspective, what makes sense from um, some of the parameters that we've laid out here. Um, just to let you know, we have been uh, going out to the community uh, quite a bit over the last month or so to get their feedback. Uh, as I mentioned, this uh, committee that sort of oversaw the process, there were six uh, members of the community, leaders in the community, so that we had that input going on throughout the whole process along with uh, the professionals who were helping us through this. So you can see on, on your screen here um, some of the different uh, community uh, organizations that we've gone out and talked to. Last uh, week, we had an open house. There were probably 50 to 60 people that turned out for that to learn more about it, give their feedback. Uh, I can tell you everyone wants a grocery store um, that you've heard before. Um, but um, so we're going to also try to do that again um, over in the Evans Churchill community if we can get that um, set up. In addition, we wanted to make sure that the development community was weighing in on this. Did this make sense from their perspective, what we're trying to lay out? We visited uh, about 15 developers and contractors through this process. We've gotten very positive feedback uh, on, on these uh, proposals. 
Uh, in addition, we went to the Arizona, Arizona Multifamily Housing Association yesterday to let them know about it, to get this word out to as many people as possible. We want uh, the IDA to, to get its price on the property here. Uh, so we want to have a lot of competition for that. So uh, this is the, we'll let Scott continue on this. Great. Thank you, Dan. Thanks so much. Uh, you know, before we get into the details on the evaluation criteria, just an acknowledgement very quickly. Maricopa County has been very helpful in this process, and I think their interest in having something happen on the site uh, to where it's not vacant property is has been a tremendous asset. And so Tom Manos' team, and specifically Shelby Sharbach and Dennis Lindsay, have been very helpful and uh, very uh, instrumental in making this whole project happen. So. Um, what's on the screen here is the evaluation criteria that we're proposing for the RFP, similar to a lot of the other uh, uh, solicitations that we've listed before and brought before this group. Uh, there's a big focus in this one on having a qualified developer who's been there and done that and has done this scale of development and this complexity of development. So that's why you see the points allocated really highly for qualifications. And then there's also very high points for scope and scale of the project. I think we're really interested in as Dan mentioned, finding density on this site. I don't know if we really want something that's three or four stories on this site. We're looking for something a little more than that. We think this site has the capacity to be able to deliver that. There's a couple things we are asking for as part of the RFP. Proposers have to uh, provide a performance deposit as we do with a lot of the larger RFPs. We haven't nailed down a number on that one, but it'll be a, a significant deposit, re refundable deposit, of course, if you don't uh, if you're not selected. And then there's also a requirement that uh, we are setting a bar and essentially saying that everyone that proposes has to at least provide a financial return to the Industrial Development Authority that meets their requirements as our equity partner in this effort. So uh, we're working to define what that number is and that will be in the, uh, in the RFP. So everybody's really clear about that number. Um, and it, just I'd like to introduce very quickly uh, Mr. Salgado to walk through uh, some of the uh, uh, things that the IDA will be looking at as part of your evaluation in the process. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. On uh, behalf of the Board of Directors for the Phoenix IDA, we're very proud to be a partner in this effort. As you know, we value the relationship with the City of Phoenix. Uh, a, a note uh, to uh, make is that, you know, we've got about $3 million invested in this project. Uh, we believe in the West Fillmore. But really the thing goes back to you because without your support of the bonds that we issue, we're using fees that we earn from these transactions to invest back into the community. So again, uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to, to work with you on this effort. Uh, Scott mentioned that uh, we're looking for a return on our investment. I think for us is really just to be made whole so that we can use those proceeds to go back and do some other good things in this community. So again, on behalf of the board, thank you very much for the opportunity to work with you today, Ms. Scott. Great, thank you. Uh, just a few other things we will be including in the uh, in the RFP in addition to the IDA's requirements, we will have an appraisal for the property. That's actually already underway um, and being uh, completed right now. And we will include the uh, results of the planning study that Dan walked through as well. And once again, as a guideline, um, these uh, proposers that are gonna be submitting proposals to us will actually be putting equity in their, their financially investing in this project. And if they think uh, our feasibility study is just a little bit off and they want to tweak it a little bit and add more retail, for instance, or if they think a grocery store is viable on this site, we'd love to hear it. So it's an open process. We're also thinking about the evaluation panel and on the screen here are a few ideas, uh, just like most of the solicitations that we issue. Uh, we'd like to have broad representation, including uh, staff and uh, community representatives, uh, as well as uh, the IDA given their equity position in this, uh, in this um, initiative. Um, and then also we're proposing to put private sector developers on the panel to be able to really cut through and understand uh, the viability of the proposals. Uh, we've also heard uh, suggestions to have other individuals on the panel, perhaps a sustainability representative, uh, to make sure that we're covering that. Um, and we're happy to hear if you have any suggestions or input additionally on that one. Uh, from a time frame standpoint, we are planning to issue the RFP here in March um, and have the RFP out on the street for at least 60 days, probably a little longer. And so after uh, an evaluation panel and interviews and all that, we'll probably be back to the subcommittee with a recommendation uh, to enter into a contract sometime in the fall. So with that, happy to answer any questions. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments? But uh, I'm I'm sorry, Councilwoman. Let me just mention that one card. Uh, just mark in favor, uh, David Roderick, Downtown Phoenix Partnership. Mark in favor. Uh, does it need uh, wish to speak? But of course, I'm sure he's willing if we need him to. Okay, but obviously, I just wanted to mention that. So one card on this item, and I'll turn to you, Councilwoman. Thank you for going out into the community and talking to folks about this. It's exciting to have a parcel of this size in downtown. And we have a lot of momentum in downtown, especially after this weekend. So I think it will get a lot of interest. One thing I did hear from the community about this was that they did want a project with an urban feel that was very walkable and that avoided super blocks. So could you talk a little bit about the future of Fifth Avenue? Absolutely, yes. Uh, and Dan, feel free to chime in here. Uh, but we are planning to include as part of the RFP uh, either links to or the actual documents for the tree and shade master plan, for the bicycle master plan, uh, the urban form code, um, and several other uh, um, uh, documents and, and um, initiatives that have been adopted by the city or created by the city that kind of set the stage and the vision for what this kind of neighborhood could be. Uh, as part of the planning process, uh, the master planners have already started looking at the streetscape and we've deliberated back and forth for instance on whether or not you're gonna We want to put a median in with trees in the middle of the street and, Or do you want to focus the, the landscape and the the investment out where the pedestrians are? And by my comments, you know where we <laughs> where I end up on that one um, Dan anything else to add on that one? No, I, I think that I think Scott summed it up uh, pretty well. It's really the, the focus is um, is the, the pedestrian feel along the sidewalk. The urban form code, which is in place, already sort of locks that into place in terms of shade uh, requirements and, and the appropriate landscaping and so forth. So I think, I think we're in good shape, and linking to all those things will be a critical part as well. Wonderful. Well, I just want to, I think, you no surprise, but we'd love to see a project that doesn't need a lot of variances and that has very active streets, which is clearly a value in this. And when it does come time for a motion, I would love that we include the, the panel to include someone with professional expertise on the building side that a background in sustainability. So someone with a LEED certification or similar from the private sector. That's great. Any other questions, comments? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks so much uh, for everyone's hard work on this. The IDA, uh, Juan, just really want to thank you for the IDA's involvement. And um, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head on this one. There are a lot of projects uh, that we've been pleased to have come before the council and you know, people have to understand in the end, even if these projects, I'll say it, aren't located in the city of Phoenix, there are great benefits that come because you're generating revenues that can be used to support projects like this. So I just wanna make sure we, uh, we, we don't forget that. And we remember that as additional projects come to us at the council. So thank you for your involvement and I agree I want to thank the county uh, because this wouldn't be possible without their partnership and I want to thank our uh, our colleagues over there on the Board of Supervisors for supporting this and all the the staff over there I'm very excited about this project and I'm excited about the the developers who are showing interest in this um, uh, you know the DMBs of the world these are folks that were doing master plan communities out at the edge of the desert who are excited about these projects. So that's one thing I wanted to ask when you talk about, you know, having experience and, and when you're figuring that in, we're not just, I assume, we're not just looking for people who have done downtown projects before. If someone hadn't done a downtown project, that wouldn't be a mark against them, would it? Uh, no, that would not be a mark against them. We, we really would like to find a, I think what we're looking for is a development team. There are developers who specialize in different kinds of uh, projects, uh, different kinds of, you know, there's apartment developers, there's townhome developers, there's retail, and I think the development team that we're looking for is gonna have elements of all of those so that they can pull from uh, that expertise. Well, that's, that's great, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. Um, and just to kind of follow up on what uh, Councilwoman Gallego was talking about, I think that um, having someone, I would be fully supportive of a motion that included having someone with some sustainability background. I think there are uh, outstanding opportunities to employ uh, the uh, power parasol or similar type of technologies there with the shade, you know, combo shade solar structures. I mean, that, that jumps right out at me. And I think that 
if we don't look at those opportunities, we'll really be missing out on a, on a wonderful opportunity for this this neighborhood um, and this this important area of downtown. So thanks to everybody, and I will certainly be supportive of this item. Okay, thank you, Captain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is the old Pappas School site, correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, I, I am very excited to see us go forth with this project. I, I just want to be assured that um, one, it's a quality project. I sometimes think the east side gets preference, uh, and the west side is just as important, and I think this could really showcase. It is a prime piece of property um, that should really uh, exclude everything that we have been pushing, uh, whether it's sustainability, it's um, the location. I, I guess my one concern is when you talk about walkability and the streets and you put a school in, um, I, I want you to make sure that you take extra precautions that uh, we look for school safety. Um, I, I love lush landscaping, but we need to consider it grows, and we do not want to make uh, it hazardous in the future in any way. I think that needs to be taken in uh, to consideration because that does play a role in the safety of, of children walking back and forth to school. Because I see this as an area where a lot of kids would walk to school, and I want to make sure that uh, that is taken into consideration and given a high priority. So, but I, I am looking forward to see what you come back with. And I think we have some exciting possibilities. So thank you. And thank you, Rob. All right, thank you. Just when I thought I couldn't like Delta Williams anymore, she says, <laughs> the, I do. She says the west side is just as yeah. important. <laughs> and she's talking about safety. And this this is a good project. This 7.4 acres is is if done correctly, and I'm confident it will be done correctly, especially with the recommendations that you're hearing and the people that are already showing interest and the people involved. Thank you, Juan. Uh, I want to thank the IDA for being involved. And David Kreider is here. I'd like to thank David. And of course, you know, our team with Paul Blue, Christine Mackey, and, uh, and Scott Sumner, especially you with all the work that, uh, that you put into these downtown projects. Um, there's, you know, this 7.4 acres will be done. I'm confident it's going to be done correctly, and it's going to impact this entire area. And uh, and it's it's good for it's good for Phoenix. Uh, I I don't I there was again one card, and I can just keep going. But I would be re reiterating uh, the comments that were made. I uh, appreciate the uh, you know the. LEED certified, uh, you know, criteria. Uh, and, and that said, I'll just I'll just ask for a motion. You, yes. I move approval of staff's recommendation with the additional criteria of a sustainability private sector sustainability expert on the evaluation panel. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you so much. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, item number eight. Goes about road business improvement district update. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, members of the subcommittee, uh, we have today with us uh, staff and uh, Dave Kreider representing um, Downtown Phoenix Inc. and representative of neighborhoods uh, and business associ associations, which Dave will recognize in the presentation to discuss with you. Uh, this both the success we've had for using business improvement districts to date and the opportunity to advance that success beyond just the core of downtown uh, and an exciting proposal to really help support uh, what has to date been pure blood sweat and tears by neighborhood uh, representatives who had to go out there and do it every Friday night and Saturday night for 10 years maybe we can and so we're here today to talk about a way to create a sustainable opportunity uh, for advancing the great work that's happening in the Roosevelt neighborhood. And so with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Scott to uh, kick off the presentation. Great. Thank you, Paul. So last year, the uh, subcommittee and city council authorized a consultant study to evaluate 
creation of a new business improvement district at the request of individuals in the, uh, in the neighborhood. Um, we've been at it now for about uh, six or seven months and are just here today with an update. Um, really kind of a check-in and status report and here's where we're at. Um, we are not looking for action today, but if you have input or suggestions, we are happy to hear them. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dave Kreider. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think as uh, the subcommittee knows, business improvement districts are authorized by state uh, statute um, and uh, Probably the best example that I can give you uh, is uh, the recent Super Bowl activity where your leadership and the city staff and the host committee uh, threw this great event uh, downtown, but behind uh, that, uh, your staff was the staff of the Downtown Phoenix Partnership, which provides the core services within the bid that handle the logistics every day. Um, the um, uh, one critical point I want to make here is that the, the, this study process was initiated uh, by business and community uh, representatives uh, that came out of the Roosevelt and Evans Churchill uh, community. They're represented by Kevin and Greg here uh, today. Uh, DPI was asked uh, to function as uh, the administrative entity uh, that would help manage the bid. We hired an extremely good um, consultant with a lot of national expertise to work with the community on the bid planning process. Uh, unfortunately, she was very ill today, so you're going to get me instead. So I'm going to run through uh, the presentation uh, very quickly. Uh, this uh, has been a community-driven process to this point. Uh, we've had a very, very strong working group made up of uh, community leaders and property owners uh, and an advisory committee. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, summary uh, survey work, focus groups, uh, community group meetings, over 23 meetings, uh, 290 stakeholders uh, have participated over the last six months. So it's been a very uh, inclusive process. Uh, the discussion uh, has focused on what the boundaries should be, what services would be uh, the priority of uh, property owners uh, and community uh, representatives in that area, what it would cost to do a bid. Uh, a number of options were evaluated, uh, and now we've reached the point uh, where we have a draft proposal, draft budget, and draft map uh, that I just uh, want to briefly uh, review with you. Uh, so uh, the proposal, and again, this was based on the community feedback that uh, was received, uh, focused on five elements uh, to provide professional uh, management uh, for uh, the business improvement district if it's created in the northern part of downtown. Uh, to focus on aesthetic enhancements uh, through beautification, uh, really playing on kind of the arts uh, focus of this uh, part of uh, the city. Also, I think as the council knows, uh, there's a great streetscape uh, project getting built uh, on Roosevelt right now, uh, and this provides an opportunity uh, for the maintenance of that streetscape going forward. Uh, parking coordination, business recruitment and event management, I think uh, this part of the downtown uh, if a bid is established, has a real opportunity to create a cohesive uh, parking plan that involves some district parking. So that was included in the draft plan. Marketing uh, and branding, uh, there's uh, great branding right now for uh, the Roosevelt and Evans Churchill community based uh, on uh, the art success that they have had, but also tremendous opportunity to broaden and deepen that. Uh, and then finally, uh, core bid functions uh, that involve uh, keeping the community uh, what we call clean and safe. And I, I think you see that in the downtown bid every day with the ambassadors uh, in the street uh, uh, management team that we have. Um, this uh, just gives you kind of a sense of, um, of where, uh, of how the downtown is organized relative to the creation of a potential bid. Uh, business improvement districts have to be located within downtown redevelopment areas. Uh, that's the area that is uh, in red on this map. Uh, the existing bid uh, that's managed within the core uh, is uh, in orange, and the potential new bid uh, area is in blue. So uh, again, I really want to emphasize that this is uh, about a draft uh, proposal uh, that was developed based on the initial uh, round of meetings in the community, uh, and the map uh, that uh, is now the focus of what would be the second phase of the analysis uh, includes uh, the area in downtown uh, north of Fillmore, 
uh, bounded on the east by 7th Street, on the north by I-10, and on the west by uh, on 7th Avenue. Uh, the five program elements uh, in this initial draft budget uh, would cost approximately $465,000. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's the area of focus. This is just a, a property map that gives you a sense of uh, how that area is separated in terms of residential uh, and commercial uses. Um, and uh, the next steps, which I, I think are, are very critical in this process, uh, involve taking the proposed geographic uh, area of focus, uh, taking the program of work and taking the budget, and then going back into the community with the property owners and the community interests uh, to vet that, make sure that uh, the information uh, that we received that resulted in the creation of the draft plan is accurate. It's going to allow an opportunity to go to each individual property owner and say, at this budget level, this is what it would cost you um, as an individual. Uh, it would uh, allow uh, the conceptualization of, uh, conceptualization of uh, governance uh, entity uh, for the bid. Um, and then um, it would involve uh, an affirmative uh, petition process where we would work with the property owners in the area uh, to make sure that there was strong consensus and strong support uh, before moving forward. Um, as uh, I said earlier, this is a process that was initiated uh, by some very strong and dedicated community interests uh, and property owners that are in the northern part of downtown. Uh, Kevin Rail, who is the chair of the Evans Churchill a community uh, association, but also a tenant in a commercial building uh, in the potential bid area. Um, and Greg Esser, who is a property owner in the Roosevelt area and very committed to the arts community, have been instrumental uh, in advancing this process. And I uh, just want to turn it over to them for a couple of minutes to give their perspective. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is. The, the really interesting part starts now, right? Which is going out to people and having a conversation of here's a budget, here's what impacts to you for your property, um, and you know, seeing that, having that conversation that people are in and out. Um, so background in the history, you know, there's that, um, the Teddy's to-do list that was created through a big project last year. Um, I don't know how much you guys spent on that. That was huge, anyways, big endeavor. Um, and, and it's something that the community up there has a lot of people that are, right, blood and sweat and work for free, that it's just unsustainable. And uh, the current bid has tons of resources and it's obviously different. So having it as a separate bid makes a lot of sense, obviously keeping some interactions together. Um, but yeah, I think this next part will be really interesting. We're seeing what people want to pay for, what they get, and having them all have that conversation. And the basic outline of where it's going to be you know, that's gonna change, right, depending on those conversations. And uh, yeah, Nancy's been great too. She unfortunately is sick and couldn't be here, but she's been out and her team is canvassing. And the plan, I think, is come back with, you know, a, a, what is it, like a, say a list of people who are saying they're in, not trying to get a bare minimum of the 51%, but make sure there's a broad consensus of what's gonna happen and how it's gonna work. Appreciate uh, Paul's comment about blood, sweat, and tears. This this effort today really does build on decades of volunteer effort by hundreds of people in the community, really working together and trying to advance the future of this community. And this effort really represents a critical piece to creating a sustainable way to ensure the importance of the arts in this area, the character of the area moving forward. And so we really appreciate the support of DPI, the support of the City of Phoenix, and your support to really help us advance to this level. And we appreciate the opportunity to to continue working on this. So with that, we'll. Take any questions? So, okay, thank you for the presentation. We do have one card, again, Mark in favor. David Roderick, Downtown Phoenix Partnership, for the record. And that said, I'll open it up for any questions or comments. Councilwoman Gallego. First off, while we're giving congratulations for a successful weekend, many congratulations to everyone at the table for putting downtown on a map in an even bigger way. It was. Very, very big success and you know, it's years of hard work, but I think it paid off. Um, I have the pleasure of representing 7th Street and I would just love to encourage as much as possible the businesses on the east side of the street. Some of them I think could be great partners as we expand the events presence and in some of our past conversations on um, 
traffic management and downtown branding. We've had a lot of concepts that include uh, a lot of coordination with both sides of 7th Street as a major gateway. I suspect Councilman Nowakowski would say the same thing about 7th Avenue. So I know this is not really focused on residential and there's a boundary on how far east we can go, but to the extent possible, if we could include people on both sides of the street, I think that would create a lot of successes and I think there's some businesses that are already up and running, but there may be also some transitions where the business recruitment could be really helpful to the type of gateway to downtown that we all want to see. Um, thank you for all your hard work and, and getting the feedback on this and being out in the community. I do have to say you did have a standard as being like the top handouts in the past with, with the Teddy's list and, and others, so we always love to see the, the artistic side of, of what you bring to us and look forward to what is coming next. And I know if our office can be helpful in spreading the word about what this has done in other areas and what, it, what the vision could be for next steps, please let me know. Any other questions, comments? Councilman? Um, I would just echo uh, Councilman Gallego's comments. Congratulations, uh, Grand Slam home run, whatever you want to say, all the cliches. I mean, uh, what was really neat about Super Bowl Central and everything was I think the people up in my district who, I mean, everyone who's down here downtown, they know how cool downtown is, but a lot of people in my district found that out this week. Um, and I think that's borne out by the number, what, 126,000 people were on light rail on Saturday alone. A lot of those people were coming from outside of downtown, obviously, up in District 3, District 2, District 1, parts of probably southern parts of your district. So thank you to everybody. It was, I've really not been prouder um, than, than I was this week as a, as a city councilman. But one question that I did have is, and if I heard you right, David, so the business improvement districts are only allowed, you say they're only allowed in the downtown area? So, yeah, in the downtown redevelopment area, I mean, you guys know what's coming here. Uh, North 32nd, uh, this seems like this would be a perfect tool for that area. It's one of the challenges we have, not to take this out of downtown, but just for one moment, if there was any way that, uh, as, as other areas of the city uh, evolve, uh, that this would be a fantastic tools for possibly other areas of the city. Mr. Chair, Councilman Gates, this is a topic that is coming up in other, uh, with other cities in the region, and if this is something the council would have an interest adding to our legislative agenda, I don't know if someone's been pursuing this uh, or interested in dropping a bill, but this is an interest that is arising because of the success of the Downtown Phoenix Partnership over 20 years, and uh, I think there's an observation of giving a vehicle for property owners to band together to make improvements to their community uh, on a collective basis you know does have value i think actually uh, is incredibly supportive of helping staff do something because it helps creating consensus and a coalition of the willing and so if, if it's an interest of the subcommittee we could certainly uh you know work to uh, have additional dialogue about this I think that that's what makes this uh, Roosevelt Evans Churchill bid so interesting and exciting to work on. The core bid was really created by the big business interests uh, in downtown in the late 80s and early 90s. This is a community-driven, small property owner-driven process that I do think has implications for other parts of the city. Now what's the stat? Arizona's like last per capita something of having bids, like compared to all the other states. Something that I agree would be interesting in other places. Way behind. Yep. I'm, I'm so glad Councilman Gates brought that up because I think we've had a couple of conversations about Metro Center area, uh, how important it is, and I personally would like to see us pursue that. Uh, a question Does the City of Phoenix put any money into this? I haven't heard that stated. So uh, the city wears kind of two hats in this regard. regard. One is as uh, someone who uh, commissioned the study and, and who retained BPI and Nancy Horman to do this, and the other is as a property owner. Um, the city in the current bid, um, no, or, no city organization or county or fed has to contribute, but we do. Um, we always have in the, in the downtown uh, redevelopment area, so in the, in the existing bid. 
Um, so we are right now in the process of understanding exactly what our contribution would be and working with the respective departments that are responsible for these parcels and understanding the services that we'd get, just like every other property owner out there. Uh, well, I know the downtown one is very advantageous for the city of Phoenix. Uh, we get much more for our money than we would have otherwise. So I expect this to be very similar because I think it's a great idea. I, I, I'm very supportive of it. Uh, I think it will work as a showcase in an area that has worked very hard for many years uh, and has really not only put forth the effort, uh, but the success of your efforts is very obvious. And I want to congratulate you. Uh, I'm very supportive of this project. If you want a motion, I move approval. Great. Uh, I, I too am supportive. Uh, I think of places like Grand Avenue and, you know, <clears throat> going out, excuse me, uh, you know, what's, what's good for the city is good for all districts. Uh, but certainly, you know, I, I can think of a few places in District 5 as well. So that said, I do want to go back to a comment to, to just congratulate the group uh, of this past week. I brought, I had the privilege of hanging out with my daughter. She's 20 years old, so that's really, really special. And, uh, and you know, it's a telling statement when you're walking through and a 20-year-old kid is looking around and she says, this is really good for our city. And that's a big deal. And, and there are a lot of, you know, I'll call them, I have a 20-year-old, so I can say kids uh, or young men and women, you know, or old men or whoever, when people feel that way and they feel especially like the capital, the transplant capital, you know, some people would refer uh, us to uh, of the country. When people take ownership and say, this is our city, this is good for our city, and you help get that and, and bring that out, that's a really special thing. So thank you for your efforts and for your part in doing that. Um, and, and so like my colleagues, I am in support and I think we have a motion, or we will. A second. Yeah, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 All right. Motion carries. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. OK, moving on to uh, 9, Phoenix Parking Cooperative. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee, uh, <coughs> as we continue to pursue more sustainab sustainable development, uh, focus on walkable uh, communities, which are absolutely essential, important parts of making uh, our downtown uh, and our community writ large great. In the end, uh, business, the, the members of the business community who have business operations need a way for their employees to physically get to their operations, and not all of them have access to um, public transportation or can walk. Uh, and so uh, we have some challenges uh, in the central city because uh, buildings were designed before uh, uh, at a time when real estate was consumed in a much larger fashion per, per person. And so the demands of parking, albeit we have great assets, are still quite large. And so Chris Mackey today is going to talk to you about a very innovative uh, proposal to try and advance our ability to work with the parking resources that are already here, see if we can't share them better, that can drive more business formation within uh, the central city. Chris? Thank you. Good morning, Chairman and Council Members. Uh, Mr. Blue stated it very well. One of the biggest challenges that we face in locating tenants in the central city is the perceived lack of parking, not only for locating new tenants, but for putting, uh, expanding our existing tenants. Many of the central city, we're trying to make it more entertaining for you. So many of uh, the central city buildings were constructed during a time when parking was anywhere from two to four per thousand. Now the demand is five to eight per thousand. So when the buildings were built in the central city, they were law firm space, they were banking space, and you had two people per thousand square feet, you have big offices, large conference room, large lobbies. That's changed. 
not just for technology companies, but for all companies. So when we work even with our traditional financial services firms, our financial, our banking companies, they're looking at a new work plan as well. So they're no longer looking at those three to four people per thousand. They're looking at a much more efficient use of their space. They're looking at anywhere from 125 to 200 square feet per person. The buildings that are here in downtown and midtown in the central city, for the most part, can't meet those parking requirements. And that's part of the reason that we see vacancy rates in this area of anywhere from 25 to 38%. I have uh, had the pleasure of being here five months now, and I've toured most of the buildings in downtown and midtown, the older buildings. I walk through space with brokers that have not had a tenant in them for a decade. So they're buildings that are challenged. They're, uh, there are concepts and ideas to fix that. So as we talked about a moment ago, the square feet per person is not going to grow. It's going to do nothing but get more and more efficient as we move forward. So that 125 to 200 square feet per person could even actually shrink in the near future. While we see some relief being provided by light rail and other types of transportation, to qualify for a project, a building has to meet certain requirements. So traditionally what'll happen is from a site selector, from GPAC, from the Commerce Authority, from a broker, we get a form sheet that tells us, submit your buildings that meet these requirements. I need it to have 100,000 square feet, has to have six per thousand in parking, needs to be of close access to light rail, needs to have, needs to have, needs to have. And we've got to make a check mark on every one of those buildings. What we're finding is that our buildings in the central city are challenged to make consideration for a tenant's review. Now, mass transit is a tremendous benefit. It accounts for, in the, in the, in the beginning, about a, a one space per thousand. Once tenants get down here, as I did when I came down here, I figure out really quickly I can use mass transit really easily. But if you don't make that list, the employees don't find out that they can use mass transit. So while they think they need five to eight per thousand, they probably really don't. But just to get on that list, that's where you have to go to. Now, while the staff works very closely with transit-oriented design, and all of the plans, the walk walkable urban codes, a lot of these buildings were built prior to those codes. So their parking solutions weren't in place and they faced those challenges. Our largest problem is the lack of parking disqualifies a project. So we don't even know that we haven't had an opportunity to make a short list for a project. With the web the, and information data the way it is today, site selectors will often just go into CoStar They'll just go onto the city's website. They'll just go onto a broker's website, look for buildings that meet their requirement. Nope, that one doesn't meet it, and I don't see any solution. We're no longer even considered for that type of project. So we have a solution, and the solution um, was actually born out of a conversation that we had with Councilman Nowakowski. Councilman Nowakowski challenged us. We were working with a tenant, and he challenged us to create a solution for that tenant that allowed for them to meet a pretty significant parking requirement for downtown. As we talked about it, we thought creating a catalog of all of the parking places in the central city um, would be a good way to meet that parking requirement. So where, um, where we were, were looking for Councilman Nolkowski in a small area, our proposal would be to go from Buckeye to Camelback between the sevens and catalog all of the parking that is available in that area. Now, you'll recall back in December, you approved an RFP with our parking team that allowed for them to go out for an RFP. Convention centers parking is expiring. Their parking management's expiring. So not only are they out for an RFP on their parking management, but part of their requirement is going to be to create a public website to catalog the parking around the convention center here in downtown that people that are coming down to downtown can log on and look, it's $6 an hour, or it's this per month, and this is who I contact, and this is where it is. We're proposing to complement that RFP that comes through and complement that database, working closely with our parking team to really remove that perceived barrier to parking. There is ample parking in downtown, it's just finding it. And we often can't get before the tenant to say, you really don't have an issue there, let me show you where the parking's at, so if we've got a public place that we can market to, that we can drive tenants to, brokers, site selectors that show there is, that's a perceived barrier to entry, it's not real. You're doing your building owners a disservice by not marketing these sites um, will allow us to gain more tenants in this market. Our second advantage is our partnership with the Downtown Partnership. 
they have done a tremendous job at already cataloging many of the parking opportunities here in downtown and they've been gracious enough to provide us with all that data so we have a great jumping off point to be able to move forward with this. So kind of our next steps to get there will be to catalog all of the parking places between the sevens, Camelback to Buckeye, send a letter to each of those building owners and say, would you like to participate in this? You don't have to, it's not forced, this is private, but would you like to participate in that? Um, and our, our gracious um, parking team this morning volunteered to help us with this, so it was very, very thoughtful and kind of them. Um, we had thought CED staff would be working to catalog all of this. They would like to help us gather all the information, host a database of all of the information that's available working in partnership with parking on their website, on our website, on DPI's website, and on Discovery Triangle's website, and then do a marketing campaign in conjunction with the RFP to get the information out to the brokers, the building owners, the local thought leaders and decision makers that tell them, we have a solution, you don't need to worry about parking any longer. These will be private negotiations between a, a landowner, a parking owner, and someone looking for um, that space. Our job will be to facilitate the conversation, to hook them up together so they can enter into private negotiations. Now where our parking garage is today on the private side, we'll allow you to use it today for $6 an hour. You could rent it for $45 a month. That's not what these tenants need. If they're signing a five-year lease, they need to know they're guaranteed those parking spaces for five years. So we would be looking at a much more robust program than anything that exists today. We, as we talked to our parking team, we thought it was also a great way for us to work together on city parking structures. Is it a way for the city to earn revenue in the downtown and midtown area? Do we have some additional parking places that aren't being utilized today? And what would our cost be working through council not abating the parking costs, but our traditional fee structure, our traditional card structure, and putting those through the process, hooking up those tenants with our individual city employees who control that parking. Um, so the city would create that strategy to gain awareness of what's truly available in the parking in, in the downtown and midtown area. As a staff, we really believe that is a strong component of reducing the vacancy in this area. We think we can get it down into the, into the teens. Uh, pretty quickly by being able to market this parking. Every single broker and tenant I talk to says, you have no parking down there, how can I look? You have great buildings, great local restaurants, great light rail, but you don't have any parking. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Okay. One card, uh, David Roderick in support. Thank you, sir. Oh, he's very agreeable. <laughs> And he's not just loitering, he's, he's participating. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Rudder. Okay, uh, council woman. Thank you, you for addressing this. This does seem like really low hanging fruit to help us with economic development and we appreciate Councilman Nowakowski's leadership on this issue as well. Would love it if we could also, we um, have a contract with Tango, which is helping us with pay service. Mm -hmm at some of our garages, and I think they have some good data capabilities that we might be able to involve, and they also might be a good partner for those uh, downtown entities that need um, for event-based parking to really have data and solutions that could address surges situations. I would also love it if we can make sure the county is a partner on this. I've heard from a lot of, again, the event-based downtown businesses that they feel like the county's hours of operations end before a lot of their hours begin and so that there is some synergies where we might be able to have solutions, particularly in the part of the downtown footprint where the county has the most parking. And I've tried to be a champion for all of our departments coordinating, so it sounds like you are gonna keep moving that forward, but it is confusing to people in the downtown community that the convention center operates some garages and we might have a transit department involved or public works and the more we can all come together, because I think with some fluctuation in our hours of operations, we can also accommodate a lot more. This isn't all just for economic development. Some of that is for the downtown event space, but it is tied to economic development, because I think businesses want to be in our downtown footprint because of the other things that are happening as well. So if we could solve more than one problem in addition to the economic development, which is a huge priority, 
through the chair, chair Councilwoman Gallego, you make an incredible point. I'll work with our parking team on Pango mm -hmm. to gather their data and continue to work with that. Um, it, the, we have been we're having tremendous conversation with all of the parking entities within the city of Phoenix. So convention center has been at the table. Our parking team has been at the table. All the groups who control all of our, our, our public parking. So I think what our plan is to do exactly what you're saying is to bring that all together so it's more cohesive, not convention center manages this and transit manages this and with CED as a database of this, is to work really collaboratively together um, and create that. I, I'll be honest, after only being here five months, I didn't know they all existed until this morning. And so they um, were incredibly gracious with their time and their consideration and their thoughts through public works to and volunteered and exactly what you said, let's figure out a way to do this all together and create one cohesive front as opposed to all these kind of different entities. Um, relating to the county, I've reached out to them a number of times, so we'll continue to work with them. They do, they in the state have some lovely parking structures, particularly on the west side. Uh, we'll continue to work with them to see if we can um, encourage them to join our um, efforts as well. That would be fabulous, and I would certainly welcome streets um, and the meters being involved in the solution. I think your team has had good luck with WebPT and mm -hmm. making some changes in meters that allowed them to meet some of their parking needs. So I think that's something I'd be supportive of seeing on the table. We've got a lot more data about parking meter usage, and some of them might not all be in the right place, and that's something that should be on the table as well. We'll Thanks. absolutely include them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> uh, also, I, I want you to coordinate with ASU uh, because they have uh, some struggles, putting it politely, with parking and where the students park, and I think that has to be taken into consideration uh, with this. Uh, I, I absolutely understand what you're saying. I hope when you have completed this uh, survey and this study, you may want to come back and we may need to change uh, some of our development uh, ordinances to either include more parking or alternatives uh, for new buildings uh, to help the problem. Uh, so I'm very supportive of this. Thank you. Thank you. Th thanks for this. This is a, a great idea. Uh, love the innovative thinking. A couple things also too is if uh, the possibility of coordinating with bike share, you know, if there are, uh, you know, if there are lots maybe a mile away or something like that that folks could park at and then ride a bike in. Um, and then also too, having, I used to work across the street from Park Central Mall in the late 90s and there's a lot of parking there. So hopefully you're working, you know, one, we got a lot of parking at Park Central Mall right now and we have a lot of buildings that I know are vacant or half vacant right in that, that Central and Thomas area. So I think some great partnerships that can be made there as well. To the Chair, Councilman Gates, you're exactly correct. There's a, a sea of parking at Park Central that for the time being is a great opportunity. And our goal, hopefully in the very near future, you'll see a lot less vacancy in Midtown. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I echo the comments once again. Uh, and I am in support. We're so fortunate to have you. If you haven't heard me say that the, the last thousand times I've said it, Ms. Mackey, thank you for everything you're doing for all of us and for our city. Uh, Very fortunate to be here. Thank you. Uh, so, so that said, move approval. We have a motion. Second. And a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. This brings us to uh, item 10 is our last call to the public. No, no cards. Uh, it's not too late for David Roderick if he wants to run and grab a. In support? <laughs> Uh, we, we are encouraging cards. I, I don't want to, I don't mean to, David's a good friend and we don't want to, we're just giving him a hard time. All right, uh, future agenda items. And I know we heard uh, at least, I think, two of them that are kind of cooking a little bit. Sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the, these are items that some of which are repetitive and you see month after month. I would point out uh, that, the, uh, that the mayor's office has asked for an update uh, uh, to the Super Bowl as a kind of reporting out and uh, in the March time frame on policy and it would be clearly a 
uh, appropriate to come to this subcommittee and talk with you first and get any additional feedback and insight from you about um, how it went, things we can improve, things we should pursue for the future. And so I would, I would certainly recommend that on your next agenda. And Mr. Chair, can I follow up on that? In particular, I think the um, uh, adding a discussion of the, the open container uh, activity that we had um, during uh, downtown, you know, I think that that's something we ought to look at very closely as maybe something that could be expanded. I think that, you know, was clearly one of the things that led to the success in the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people downtown to have a have a good discussion on that as a okay. council and seems like a natural place to start that discussion here in this committee. Agreed. Any any others? No, I have a request, Chuck, sure. uh, for aviation. I would like them to review our Terminal 4 uh, street, well, not necessarily limited to Terminal 4, but the food um, street pricing policy that we have. I've had some um, serious concerns raised because we want to maintain the quality uh, of the food and the service. It has gained an excellent reputation, and after last weekend, I'm sure uh, around the world it's known for its quality and service. Uh, but I also know that um, because we have imposed some um, needs for good labor and uh, the good service and the cost of food going up, it is important that uh, we want them to stay in business and maintain that level of service. And so I would look at options uh, that we can negotiate with them to give them some relief and to assure their success. Chairman, Councilman Williams, we'd be pleased to come back and have more discussion about um, all that surrounds uh, the operation of food and beverage at Terminal 4, as well as the discussion of street pricing. Thank you. Great. Uh, I, just yep. as a follow-up to that, I, I think that's great. And also, though, I think maybe there's the, if I'm understanding what you're getting at, the other side of the coin, too, is I've heard some concerns that there aren't. Uh, even though it may be street pricing, there there's wonderful options out there. But options for lower price options for people with kids, there's not an abundance of them. And so I, I'd like to have that on the agenda as well. Uh, we, we would be pleased to discuss all things food. <laughs> Good. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Councilman Jacobs. While we're, while we're at it, maybe, you know, uh, healthy, happy meals so yep. that we were all yep. covered. There you go, Fit Phoenix. Fit. <laughs> I, I, I'm thrilled. <laughs> Hey Paul, can you can you bring us something back on street pricing? I'm just so obviously it's on all of our minds to at least have a discussion around it. Do you have anything else? Certainly supportive of the councilman's good idea that we talk about Goodyear Airport. Oh right, uh, absolutely. Okay. Just a an informational item on uh, on the airports that the city of Phoenix is involved in. Sure, I think we can we can talk about all four. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Uh, I think our next uh, item is to adjourn. Uh, no further discussion. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Uh -huh.